Well, it's been a slow start, but I think, should we kick off, Keisha? I think so. <laughs> cool. I think so. Everyone's been patient. Very much appreciate it. We'll get going for them. True that. So, Buju, Marnie and Dijnikas, Gawin and Dodo de Messine, Buju Wikwidong and Nujiba, Ona Gamin Sing and Da. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Marnie Keske. I'm the Cultural Preservation Specialist with the 1854 Treaty Authority, uh, overseeing our education and outreach division activities. I'm here with my partner in crime, Keisha Stoll. She is the marketing coordinator for the St. Louis County Historical Society. And um, today's program on wild rice is a, is a part of partnership between the St. Louis County Historical Society and the 1854 Treaty Authority. For those of you that might be coming from the more historical history buff perspective, the 1854 Treaty Authority is an intertribal natural resource management agency. We work for both the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior, Lake Superior Chippewa. And we are tasked with two items, first to protect treaty rights and second to implement treaty rights harvest for our band members within the uh, lands that were ceded or handed over to the United States government uh, in the year of 1854. That is all of present day Northeastern Minnesota. And for some of our colleagues, the natural resource world, Keisha can give you guys the, um, the summary on what the historical society is, what they do. Absolutely, we were founded in 1922 uh, with the mission, basically we collect, preserve and present the history of all of St. Louis County. We also talk about the history of Minnesota. So uh, obviously the, the uh, indigenous people, the, the natural landscapes, all of this is part of our history. It's a, it's a big part of who we are today. Our history is important. So that's why we're thrilled to partner with 1854 to do these projects. So glad to have you guys too. So uh, not only is monoman or wild rice a resonant naturally occurring feature in our area, um, but if you happen to enter any restaurant in the area and it, it's, it's always on the menu in form of chicken wild rice soup usually. Um, it is a defining character also uh, to find the migration of the Anishinaabe's people to these, this area, uh, to the Western Great Lakes region. So I wanted to test our technology by asking how many of our attendees enjoy eating wild rice. Raise your electronic hands. Holy mackerel, 44, 47, 50. Okay, now lower your hand. I got a new question for you, poll. How many of you have actually experienced harvesting rice? Hey, a 23, that's not bad, you guys. That's pretty great. Awesome, it's good to know. I'm glad. So how we're gonna run today, after we finish a short intro here, uh, we're gonna share a clip of Boys Fort Elder, uh, Gene Goodsky. I see that Ashley, his tech associate, is here with us this evening. We can't thank you enough, Ashley, for helping us out. I had a nice meeting with uh, Gene the other day, on Friday actually, and he's a big supporter of, of educating the general public on native culture. And I said, well, Gene, people really wanna know about the cultural significance of rice. Do you mind sharing some of your knowledge, some of your stories? And he's like, yeah, yeah. He's always about that, very supportive. Um, but I said, okay, how about six o'clock on Tuesday? This is coming up Tuesday. He said, that's not gonna work for me. How about three? And um, if any of you have experience working with elders, you kind of have to <laughs> respect their timeline and their wishes. So um, luckily he allowed us to record him earlier today. So I'll be showing you a clip of that. And then, uh, then we're gonna hand the microphone over to Darren Vogt. Darren is 1854's Director of Resource Management. Um, Darren has maintained 1854's longest running monitoring program starting in 1998, I believe it was. Um, we started taking data, monitoring wild rice beds throughout the 1854 seeded territory. So he's gonna talk about the biology, the ecology and um, conservation as well as some present threats to rice today. We're going to finish up with a little Q&A. Um, this is a webinar format today. Everybody is muted. 
please do us a favor by answering your questions into the chat and Keisha and I will do our best to moderate and get those questions to the right people. Um, unfortunately, if you have a uh, question that is a little more cultural in nature, uh, we do have Jalen Strong. He's the, um, the director at the Boys Fort Heritage Museum and the ba Boys Fort Van Tippo. Um, he'll be entering a little bit late. I'm, I think he's actually on. I have to let him in as a panelist, but he'll be the one to forward some of those questions. He's incredibly knowledgeable and we are so lucky to have him. Um, be sure to stick around for the whole hour. Keisha has some giveaway prizes. Uh, for those of you who have sat in last few of our events, uh, we'll be raffling off these prizes at the end. She'll be pulling the names from our registration form, uh, but she needs to match them up with the people who are on the listing as attendees. So please make sure that you have a full name listed there and gotta be present to win. So stick around for the full hour, we'll do that. Good morning, I'm gonna interrupt for just one second because I know some people are a little, not wanting to necessarily share their full name with everybody. And I totally get that. If you guys want to send me a private chat message and tell me your full name and how you're logged on on uh, on Zoom, that will work as well. Thanks. You bet. Um, what else? What else? Next week we have the last of our of our four unit series here. Um, We'll be talking about one of the coolest restoration successes in the area, at least for my opinion, uh, the reestablishment of naturally reproducing lake sturgeon population in the St. Louis River. And we'll also have a Boys Fort elder again to talk about some fish clan and, and some fish clan stuff. Um, tomorrow, I'll expect a follow up email with a program evaluation, some additional learning resources, and for those of you that requested continuing education credits. I'll be sending those out as well. Um, I am going to get this video started. Good morning, I'm going to have a like to, uh, to uh, talk to you about uh, about the racing. What? We made the first time, the first, uh, the first picking. Um, these uh, back in my day when I was when I was a when I was a boy between ten and fifteen, um, they had this uh, this rice tree. We'd, we'd be standing on. Uh, the place they call Big Rock. It was a, it was a, um, a spirit rock. The island out on the off the shore there was Spirit Island, and uh, the people used to say that was the back door to the big to the to the Spirit Island where all the spirits are. Um, and he would stand stand on top of that rock and holler. The law of a moat. That means uh, no racing. Man, and the, they had the lake sections up in three different sections. They go in one section one day, and then, the, then, the, then, the, then the, another one the next day. But anyway, after the first day, the first day of picking, they would uh, they would only go out for about an hour, and uh, they would pick probably about 50, 60 pounds, and they would come home, and uh, we parch it up. We parch it up, and uh, me and my brother had these. Uh, we had these these magazines. Leather on the bottom and, and lace and uh, denim on the top, oh. and we put them on with some with some heavy socks, and uh, and it's uh, this kettle, this kettle right here is, is from from when I was a kid, 
I, I managed to save it. And I use it uh, periodically, like uh, like our first pick. Um, you, you, you put your feet in there. It's about, uh, about 12 inches in diameter. But uh, was it made out of sand? Uh, it's wood. It's probably oak or uh, ash. Oak hmm. or ash. But I can't tell because it's painted. To preserve it. It looks like ash. Yeah, it looks like ash. And uh, that was very strong wood. But anyway, after the first pick, they would. Uh, Bring that over here. Yeah. The ash has got this. This is how we used to tie them up. And we put a put about about five pounds of uh, right parts rice in, in this kettle, probably about almost half full. And we'd start what you, what we used to call jigging. And all we would do is move our feet back and forth. Move our feet back and forth. And uh, we used to have radio. And we had country music and we used to, we used to dance to that uh, country music. <laughs> That's how my dad uh, made it easier for us. Made it more uh, so we wouldn't get bored. But um, we were we were okay with that. And, uh, anyway, uh, um, after they after we uh, finished uh, jigging the rice, then we fan fan it. We have a, that big one. We don't call it. Uh, we never call it winnowing. I don't know where that comes from, but this, this is our basket. We take about a couple of handfuls and put it in a basket, and we shake, shake it up like that. Then, then when it hit, when it hit the bottom, then all that chaff would would blow out, and uh, just kind of like a little rhythm. It goes. Then we go shake it, shake it up and down. Then we go. go sh then we see how much, how much, uh, how much, how much uh, rice we have. We have left, so we just, then we continue to 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 jig out until until it was all until we had 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 enough. Then after we had it, uh, after that, mom would make up a great big kettle of uh, kettle soup, a boiled rice soup and duck. And uh, after they got done at um, at four o'clock, approximately at four o'clock, they'd all go back up to the central meeting place, and uh, and that's where they had a great big old canvas in the middle of the ground, and everybody put all their kettles, put all their kettles around. Around the, around the ed, outside, and we all had the, we did that with a small dipper over there. No, a dipper, a little pan, saucepan. Yeah. Okay, and we'd bring up a, a pan like this, uh, and that here has spoon, and uh, the, there was a spoon and there's a ladle, a ladle, a dipping, dipping spoon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah something like this in each kettle. And uh, we, we take a little bit out of each kettle, go around, and just take about a, tea, a teaspoon out of each one. And uh, before that, uh, the rice chief would do the would do the opening ceremony, the first pick ceremony 
Um, it's wrong, it's piped by a scene and we will get my pipe out of that. Out of that pipe bag. It's right on the right on the floor there. Just bring the, the pipe, yeah. Yeah. This is the exact pipe that he used. This pipe is probably about 250 years old. And I was fortunate to receive it. <coughs> it was at my cousin's house. She was a get some of water out there. Back she was right behind me. Yeah, she, uh, the thing is, she was um, she was uh, given the pipe to take care of after he after he passed away. Then uh, every time she'd want to, she'd look for something. Here, the pipe was there, and she'd move it out to a different place. Then she'd be looking for something again, and there the pipe was. Finally, she went in, moved it to the to the car in the trunk. There, she said. I don't want to bother with the pipe anymore. But two weeks later, she had a flat tire. And she went in to the trunk to get the spare tire, and what was there? The pipe. The pipe gave her a flat tire. <laughs> Then she had a dream a couple days later, and uh, it was me and my mother, and, and her and her mom. And uh, then she went over to her mother that morning. She said, "I had a dream about uh, my mother's sh uh, short name. Her her in her real name was Baby Gomat Tebinesik. Baby Gomat Tebinesik." And everybody called her Gamat, for short. So she, um, her mom says, let's go see Gamat and, and Jean. Take the gig with him. So um, they went over and, uh, and her mom told, told us the story that Myra told us the story. And then right away, mom said, let's go see the old man. So we went over there and, and we brought him some tobacco. And he started to smoke his to, uh, smoke the tobacco that we gave him. He said, What what I what they what the spirits told me, he said, no more years ago, because Myra, he, he said, you have to pass his pipe over to to Jane because he, he wants to come back into the circle to help people. So then um, he, he told us what to do, go get them bagichi gun offerings, make a dish and tobacco and then come back as soon as you get that, that done. So that's what we did. Then we went over there and uh, we, we, bought the, we brought the bagichi gun and the tobacco and the, the, the dish. And uh, we went back over his house and he starts loading up his pipe and he looked at Myra he said he says Mama Gijigo when I looked at you and I nod my head he said you passed the pipe over to Jean he think he would have he used to call me Nagamoda which means let's sing because I used to sing on the drum but anyway he uh he uh well he, he looked at Myra and he said when I look at you and nod my head, you pass the pipe over. And and that you're gonna have when you when you receive the pipe, load it up and smoke, he says. They knock when again, pointed in all directions, and up above, down below, blah, 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 blah. And uh, and while they were doing the ceremony, uh, he he looked at my and she, she passed it over and uh, I loaded up, loaded the pipe, and I smoked. And after he got done 
some of the ceremonies are there and the pipe is, is yours to take care of. Not to have it, just to take care of it. Now that it's back in the circle, now, now the pipe is happy. It's not, it's not going to be in a bag anymore. And my mother right away, this bag must be about, about over 50, 60 years old. So she had it for quite a while. So when I got the pipe, she gave me the, this bag to, to put the pipe in. Well, anyway, that's the story about this pipe. Well, anyway, that's the pipe that he smoked, that he used for the opening, um, the first picking ceremony. There was about, oh, there must have been about 100 people. People there, and there was about five or six uh, medicine men that were all smoking their pipes and ladies. The, the, in my day, the, the, the spirit, the power of the of the addition of their uh, culture was very, very strong. It isn't like today. It's, it's today. It's just um, it's it's deteriorating. It's it's all there's nothing hard to that. Well, anyway, uh, well after you got done with the ceremony, the first pick ceremony, then we all went around the we went all around the. With our with our pan, the one that I showed you earlier, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd load this up, and pretty soon we almost have. By the time we got to about about um, about about oh, that's, there must have been about anywhere from seventy five kettles out there. And we'd all take a little little bit from each one. And uh, after he got done with the ceremony, after he got done set with the ceremony, oh, we see We see Which means eat. Everybody eat. We'll eat with the spirits. They're here. They are glad that, that, that they received the first picket. And uh, they received the tobacco. They received the the offerings, the gifts, and they were very happy. He said, "All the spirits on the lake, all the ones in the water, the keeper of the rites. His name is. Uh, they call him Emino. And uh, the rice bird." The rice bird that we see out there, Minum Nike, she is the helper. He's another keeper of the of the wild rice. Well, anyway, that's uh, that's uh, that's how, how how we used to do this. Um, and today it's very weak. I did the opening ceremony with the wild rice, and there was only twelve people over at the Powell Arbor. Twelve people compared to about. 120, 150. And back in the day when I was a kid, it was a big celebration. We were celebrating the gift that was given to us. <clears throat> but today they don't do that anymore. It's very our our culture here on on my reservation is very very weak. It's uh, it's we're losing it. We haven't had a powwow in two years. And it's very sad, and the drums are sad. We we'll pound the drums once in a while, and and whenever we do a ceremony, and then again when we do a ceremony, there's probably only about twenty people that show up. It's very very sad. Well, anyway, that's that's how they uh, that's how they did that's how they did that. Uh, the first pick, and then after that, they'd, um, the next day they'd go to an, another section, and then they'd pick for about four hours. And uh, a lot of people, including uh, including myself, uh, the first time I went out racing, this man come over to the house and he says, uh, he says, my 
after the first day of picking, they take the they take the rice out to the rice plant and they draw out some money. And a lot of people would go get drunk. And uh, well, anyway, uh, he looks at me, he says, uh, you paddle a canoe? I was only about, um, about 14 years old. I said, yes, I paddle a canoe. Then he looks at mom and dad and he said, can he come out? Can he can he go out racing with me? And they they said, yeah, if he wants to. And I said, yes, I I want to. And uh, mom packed me up a lunch and had some some Kool Aid and, and off we went. Then when we the first day we we must had about uh, we must have had about about three hundred pounds of green rice. And I was paddling that around. And he was so proud of me that I didn't stop. Only stopped to drink, uh, take a couple of drinks of Kool-Aid. And then at lunchtime, we had, uh, we took a break, about a half hour, not even that, and ate our sandwiches and Kool-Aid, blah, blah, blah. And uh, then the next day, he come over to the house again. He said, well, my partner's still gone, still partying. You want to go out again? I said, oh, yes, yes. Because he gave me half of the rice. Then I went with him for three days. Then I, I had about uh, about six hundred dollars, and I bought a canoe. Then uh, my dad made some knocking sticks, and I, then I bought a partner, and uh, and I bought some paddles and and. A, and a push pole and everything else like that. And then I raced all the season, the whole season. But uh, that's where that that's where I where I started uh, earning my own money for school clothes and, and whatnot. But anyway, that's uh, that's that's how the, the rice was uh, was back in back in the day when, when I was a kid. When the when the when the our spirituality was strong, very strong. I remember that. They go to they go to different sections each day. They had the they had the lake sectioned up in three different sections. They'd rest for three days, then they they'd rest for for one or two days to let it ripen. And they took care of it. They took care of the they took care of the lake from older folks, from older medicine men and ladies. They made sure that everything was, was done right and 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 our and our culture was strong back in that day. Do you have any questions? Gene, is, is, are most of your memories from Net Lake only of racing, Net Lake? Um, I went to a Big Rice, Big Rice Lake, and uh, Vermilion. Some are the only two lakes that I ever went to Big Rice and, and uh, Big Rice Lake and uh, Vermilion, Vermilion River. Oh, okay. the only two. Are you saying that I mean you mean off reservation? Did, did you race on Net Lake too? Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. Even today I'm I race on Net Lake. Who are you? Can everybody hear me? <laughs> you are not alone. We were all spellbound by the story. I was like, did I shut out my Zoom? Everybody's gone. <laughs> There's like a hundred people. They're all ticked off. Oh no, but thank you all. <laughs> I'm glad that we got to hear a few words from Jean. 
And uh, even just chatting with Ashley here via text, she's like, I love my gramps. Every time I hear stories, I learn something new and so do we. So um, I gotcha to both of you for your assistance with that. Um, Darren, I'm gonna hand the screen action over to you to talk a little more about um, hang on a second. We have raised hand. Is that working? Looks like it. Oh, mi miracle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nerve wracking. All right. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Darren Votes. I'm the Resource Management Division Director at the 1854 Treaty Authority. And um, yeah, I'm going to give you kind of my Minoman 101 uh, presentation tonight, kind of talk about a uh, variety of things of uh, Minoman or the food that grows on or in water. Um, first, I want to start in a good way, obviously, show a, a nice picture of wild rice, you guess, in the right frame of mind, and um, these are the things I'll be talking about, and, um, you know, wild rice has taught me so much over the years, and I'm still learning and have a lot to learn, so that's kind of a disclaimer as I go through this, it's just, it's a wonderful resource, and we heard Jean mention, too, you know, that um, rice is a, a sacred gift, um, so it must be treated resp with respect, and one thing I've learned is wild rice is, it's not an it, it's a being and a relative. And so I always try to keep that in mind when I'm working with wild rice, when I'm talking about wild rice, and when I'm communicating with other agencies, you know, if we're working to protect and enhance wild rice, I try to try to share some of those concepts, uh, something to always keep in mind. All right, start, start with a little bit of the bio, about the biology of wild rice. So it's an annual plant that grows in shallow water. So for good wild rice habitat, you think of Shallow lakes, rivers, one to three feet is kind of the prime um, water depths, and you really want that soft, muddy bottom. That's kind of the, um, the perfect habitat for rice. So being an annual plant, that means it grows from seed each year. So it starts growing soon after ice out each spring. Um, the picture on the lower left there is the float and leaf stage. So in June, the plant reaches the water surface and floats across the water surface like this. It's uh, during this time that it's um, very vulnerable to sudden changes in water levels. It can either be uprooted or even drowned out if it stays underwater for a long period of time. And then in July on the right on the bottom there, you can see it's standing out of the water and it's just developing the seeds at the end of the plant. So typically you see rice standing maybe one to three feet, but it can be really tall sometimes, six, eight feet. I even seen it even taller than that. So once it's standing in July and August, uh, it cross pollinates uh, with wind. It thought it is thought to be the prime way it pollinates, and that's usually in late July. Then in August, the kernels begin to fill with a milky substance, and that hardens to become the um, seed or the grain of the plant. And wild rice ripens in late August or early September, and that's when the seeds would fall off the plant and be there for the next generation of wild rice plants. It's also during the time where humans and wildlife harvest those uh, seeds for for uh, food source. Um, I think Jean mentioned this as well too, that you know, wild rice ripens at very times. So within a given lake, different areas of the lake ripen at different times. Um, on the same plant, seeds ripen at different times, different lakes across areas ripen at different times. So the bottom line is if you're interested in harvest, um, you can go back to the same rice bed or lake uh, several times over a given season. Kind of a little photo series to just give a feel for what a wild rice lake looks like. Um, it really is a major transformation. You'll go to the lake in the spring and the upper left is uh, May. I mean, the lake looks like open water, right? And as you progress to the right to June, a little bit hard to see in this picture, but you can see if you look close, you'll see all those floating um, leaves on the surface of the water. So again, that's that floating leaf stage when the, the rice is very vulnerable to any changes in water levels. Then in July in the lower bottom here, you um, get the plants standing out of the water and August is the plants ripen and are ready for harvest. So it's amazing to see this transformation and you know, on a thick wild rice lake, it can look like a, a hay field. You wouldn't even know it's a lake. It's, it's really incredible to see. Uh, wild rice does also really varies across years. So some years you get a good wild rice crop and some years you, you don't get a very good wild rice crop. Um, a lot of that is due to water levels. Um, you can see this is Kettle Lake down in Carleton County. So after the 2012 flood, there was essentially not a stock of wild rice growing on that lake that year. Rest of it got drawn out and uprooted. You can see the very next year, 2013, was a bumper crop where again, it looked like that field of rice. So it's amazing how um, rice can vary across years. 
there's talk about this four-year cycle. It's not an exact science, but a lot of times you get a bumper crop, a couple of mediocre ones, and one that's poor. So it's really um, adapted to these changing conditions and varies over time. One other thing I should mention too is the dormancy that wild rice seed can remain in that sediment for years until favorable conditions exist. So you may not have much wild rice on a lake and for some reason something changes, maybe the water level's lower, a beaver dam blows out, all of a sudden, boom, you get a lot of wild rice back again. So that seed source is always kind of there and ready and waiting. Here's kind of talking about that four-year cycle. You get a, a upper left here, maybe a mediocre crop. This is around Island Lake up by the Isabella neck of the woods in, in the 1854 Cedar Territory. So you get a, an average crop, a poor crop, another average one, and then the last year here we get a bumper. So again, just kind of show that variation across time. How it, it's always changing. Um, so wild rice is an important part of the ecosystem, which is something we always try to remember too. So it's an important uh, food source for wildlife, uh, waterfowl in particular. If you um, know duck hunters, they're looking for wild rice waters to hunt because waterfowl really, really love the, uh, the wild rice, especially in the fall migration. A uh, variety of birds, red winged blackbirds, rails. We heard about that rice bird. I think a lot of people think those are those rails. I see those in the rice a lot. Muskrat utilize the resource quite a bit. Uh, it's used for fish nursery habitat. Um, it's just, again, part of the, a healthy ecosystem with all of their aquatic vegetation. So some of, what are some of the concerns for wild rice? Um, probably one of the biggest one is climate change. And it's, it's not just direct like heat cold kind of thing. It's how everything's interrelated here. And so, you know, one thing is changing water levels. We're seeing a lot more of these storm events. I mentioned that 2012 flood in the Duluth area where you get these huge storm events and it can wipe out a rice crop. Um, so that is a concern over time if we're getting more of these high water years and high water events. Altered growing seasons can um, maybe affect invasive species growth. Uh, other competing vegetation may start to get a foothold over rice if, this, if these seasons are changing over time. Pests and diseases, we're starting to see a little bit more different kind of fungal diseases. One's called a brown spot disease, where that's what it looks like, a bunch of brown spots growing on the, on the leaves and stalks of wild rice. And we're starting to see that in Northern Minnesota a little bit. They haven't seen in Wisconsin quite a bit more over the last five, 10 years. Anyone who's up been out harvesting knows about rice worms that can they feed on the seeds. Um, a little unknown, what's a changing climate due to rice worms? Is it good, bad, and different? We really don't know, and there's some work trying to, to look at things like that. Uh, what does a changing climate, excuse me, do to animal populations? We're um, seeing a lot more geese. So we'll talk a little bit about some restoration work we have going on where geese are just are mowing down the rice. Every plant that stands up is, uh, which is goose food. Uh, we're seeing more and more swans. Almost every little wild rice lake we've been working on now has swans on it. So is that going to be a concern over time if, if they're going to impact the wild rice? Finally, wind, rain, hail. I mean, a lot of that's maybe primarily during the harvest season, but it seems to be in the last couple of years, we've had some good rice crops and then the winds blow and knocks down all the ripe wild rice, which, you know, maybe that doesn't hurt the resource. You're, you're benefiting for the future, but it's definitely affecting harvest in, in that season. Finally, here are other development and human disturbances, and, you know, even lake development, cabin owners, boaters, things like that. A lot of people don't really realize and respect wild rice and so may, may pull it up in front of the cabin. They don't want weeds on the shoreline. I mean, things like that. So we just have to work on education. Another thing that's been in the news quite a bit in Northeastern Minnesota is the sulfate water quality standard. I don't wanna go too in depth here, but um, Minnesota does have a water quality standard for sulfate. It's 10 milligrams per liter. Um, it's been largely unenforced in areas and so, a lot of people have been asking the regulators, you know, why is this not being enforced? So there's been a lot of discussion about, is this standard appropriate? What's the right number? Where should it apply? What time of the year should it apply? So it's kind of an ongoing saga, I guess, is the easy way to say it, that we're still trying to work on and see what's an appropriate way to, to protect wild rice. Okay, and a little bit more about our program. Um, when we started our wild rice program, probably about 96 actually, um, and the first step is where is wild rice found in that 1854 Cedar Territory? So, you know, again, our organization focuses on that Cedar Territory, Northeastern Minnesota. So step one is where is rice found? Where is rice found now? Where is it found historically? 
Uh, so we did develop an initial list of waters back in 96. We had uh, assistance from actually UMD and a grad student, I think, searched every record they could find, any mention of wild rice. And so that was kind of our base, we call just our inventory of rice waters that we started back in 96. So we're constantly updating this. We'll find another information source. I'll stumble across some in the field. So, so each year we're updating our uh, kind of master list of wild rice waters in Northeastern Minnesota. So here's a map. I mean, you can see how widespread it really is. So our current list contains 521 rice waters and that's lakes or portions of rivers. I, I guess one thing to understand too is what is a wild rice water? There's no such thing as an officially designated rice water. Um, for our purposes, our definition is a water that has or did have any wild rice at all. So um, that's our current list. 521 waters in this area have or had wild rice. And most of them still have some at least. There's very few that I haven't found any at all. And it can vary from a few stocks to a thick field across the whole lake. So that's really the variation we're talking about on this list of rice waters. So we have this master list of rice waters, and then the idea was to go out and, and survey them to see how much rice is present, what's the general lake characteristics, is there a lot of development, is it mostly wild with no development, is there beaver dam, culvert issues, things like that. Um, so each year since 96, we've been going out and trying to hit a subset of, of off this list every year. And um, since 96, we've hit 363 out of those 520 waters. So it's Little by little, we're getting there. Some other partners have helped us as well. So again, it's just developing kind of our master database, uh, the wild rice resource in 1854 Cedar Territory. So the green dots on this one are the lakes we've surveyed. Um, you can see a lot kind of up here in the Bounty Waters. Um, maybe we haven't gotten to. A lot of them we're getting down to um, difficult or maybe even impossible access. I haven't even figured out access on some of them. So we keep pecking away at this, but we're getting down to a lot of the ones that are really hard to, to access. I should say too, a lot of these we do survey more than one year because a one-time look maybe not give you, doesn't give you the full pictures. I mentioned you get good years, bad years of rice. So if you visit a lake, you have no really really knowing if you're there in a good year, bad year. So we do hit a lot of waters multiple times to try to get a better look at it. So statewide wild rice, there has been some efforts too to develop a statewide list of wild rice waters. Um, here's a few listed here. Um, in 2008, a lot of partners led by the Minnesota DNR, did a, a wild rice study and developed kind of a, a list of wild rice waters. There's been some more updates on that in 2013 and Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, largely to deal with that whole sulfate issue I was talking about, has been working on kind of a list of potential wild rice waters as well. So statewide, that kind of gives me a feel for what it looks like about 2,350 waters across the state. And again, this is an ongoing process too to kind of develop and, and update this list of rice waters. And we do think rice has declined across the state. We don't have a lot of solid records, but we think over time between development and things like that, that uh, you know, we have, have lost wild rice in the state. I think we're pretty confident we can say that. Okay, so we talked about our master list of waters and we surveyed a bunch of those. And now even a smaller subset of those we've monitored on a, an ongoing annual basis to really track wild rice abundance over time. So this is what we call our wild rice monitoring. There's a group of about 10 waters we've done since 1998. Um, to, again, to just really track what's going on in more detail on these waters over time. So on these 10 waters, um, we take a look at them all throughout the year. As soon as the ice goes out, we start measuring water depth, uh, water temperature, some water quality measurements. And then in the fall, when the rice is standing and reaching maturity, that's when we go and do our wild rice density surveys. We have a, a grid of GPS points across the lake. And so each point, we'll put this square out and count how many wild rice stocks are in that square. We'll take some measurements of the plant to see how tall it is. Um, again, and this gets us an idea of density and how tall the rice is on, on a given water. And what we get from this, there's, um, some work that's been done from plant measurements, you can estimate biomass. And so that's really the results of this monitoring is we estimate wild rice biomass across years. And not to get in specifics here, but this is Kettle Lake, which I showed pictures of earlier. You can see how you, the rice kind of fluctuates over time. You get down years, up years, in between really good years. This past year in 2020 on Kettle Lake was one of the best years we had seen. And so again, over time, you can see those changes. Um, and each year we have an annual report that summarizes all this, if anyone's interested, uh, 
track me down or check it on our website. It really talks about um, the changes over time uh, on these 10 waters. And there is a standardized protocol um, developed to do this wild rice monitoring. The idea was for all entities to kind of do it in a similar way across the Great Lakes region so you can compare information. So this guidebook was developed in, in 2015 to um, help guide uh, monitoring efforts for people that are interested. So what else do we do as far as monitoring wild rice? Uh, another thing we do is aerial photos. Each fall we'll fly by airplane and, and take just basically take pictures of wild rice lakes. So we have going back to our 10 lakes that we monitor back to 91. And then since 2007, we've been working with some other partners, including um, Fond du Lac Band, DNR, and Forest Service. Um, fly the same group of waters every year. It usually takes us two or three days, but it's about, excuse me, about 80 waters across Northeastern Minnesota where we get photos of each year. And again, it's, it's just a nice, easy tool to start tracking changes over time and see if there's any concerns, you know, if, if a lake um, starts to lose wild rice, you know, try to figure out what's going on there. So what other kind of conservation activities do we do? Um, I mentioned how wild rice water levels is, a, is a, a prime thing. So beaver control is kind of an ongoing, I don't know if I want to say battle, but um, it's something we try to stay on top of. If a beaver builds a dam and raises the water six inches a foot on a lake, it's going to have, you know, considerable impacts on wild rice. So beaver control, beaver trapping, dam removal, is something we try to stay on top of working with other partners. But beaver aren't all bad either. There's thought that wild rice likes those changing conditions. So maybe a bad year or two for wild rice is good for that lake in the long haul. It may knock back competing vegetation. So I think we've kind of learned that you know, we want the lake to kind of lake to naturally fluctuate. So some beaver activities probably good in the long haul, even if you do get a down year or two of wild rice. So it's something we try to keep in mind. Um, reseeding efforts, we've done some of that as well. The seeding picture here is on a waterfall impoundment up north of Ely. We're just trying to get some seed going, mostly for waterfall in that case. But we've done some different reseeding efforts for waterfall and, and with the goal of, of harvest as well. There's been other work on trying to control competing vegetation. Uh, Big Rice Lake in particular um, has had some issues with pickerel weed taking over. So we're trying different things on water level management or, or cutting up some of that pickerel weed back just to give rice kind of a, a foothold in that lake. So some of that work happens as well. There's all kinds of cooperation, coordination with other uh, resource managers, annual meetings and work groups and researchers and students. It's just, it seems like there's more and more interest in wild rice all the time, which, which is good to see. A kind of a larger restoration efforts happening near Duluth here in the St. Louis River estuary. Um, back in 2014, there was basically a, a wild rice restoration plan developed that kind of outlined opportunities to restore rice in the estuary. And so after that plan was developed, essentially the next year uh, partners got, got at it and started getting some seed in, in the areas here. So you can see outlined in the slide here how much has been seeded, about 53,000 pounds since 2015. And I do have to give credit to the Fond du Lac band. They're the ones who have been acquiring the seed and doing the seeding. And it's no easy task to get that much seed. So a um, very uh, big thank you to them. And um, I mentioned where our success down there has been a little mixed. Um, it seems like geese is the number one issue. As I mentioned, you know, a lot of the plants, as soon as they start to emerge in July, they're just getting mowed down by geese. And so we're starting to talk to some partners about potential goose control efforts down there. Again, just to try to give rice a foothold to get going down there. All right, now a little bit about harvesting wild rice. Um, so that happens in Northeast Minnesota in late August or early September. Um, you know, the way to do it is still kind of the old school, two people in a canoe knocking rice. Um, you can see the picture on the bottom there, you use two sticks as you're uh, moving through the wild rice to, to bend the rice over and gently brush it or knock the stalks to then the ripe rice falls in the bottom of your canoe. And again, we talked about this ripening, so you can go back to the same lake several times or different lakes at different times in the years to, to kind of keep hunting for that, that ripe wild rice. You want it to fall very easy without doing any damage to, to the rice stalks. Here's a few more pictures of, of, of harvest. And, you know, what is a good day harvesting? I, you know, I guess you hear a lot of racers talk about the bottom of the canoe. I mean, if you get about 100 pounds in a day, it's considered a, a very successful day, but... It all becomes with experience. I mean, good harvesters, I've heard of 200, 500, even more pounds in a day. Um, 
And other people, you know, if they get 20 or 40 pounds a day, that's considered success. So a lot of it's um, your experience and, you know, are you there when the rice is rice, when the rice is ripe? So um, definitely a lot of variation in how successful the harvesters are. So now when you harvest wild rice, you get in the mound of the canoe, that's not the end of the story. It's, it's not ready to eat then. Um, before you can eat it, you have to, um, it's called finishing the wild rice or prepare it for consumption or storage. So these are, these are the traditional steps here. Um, first, you lay it out on, on a tarp or birch bark to dry. Um, you parch it in a pan over a fire. And then um, hulling, um, a lot of times people call that jigging or dancing on the rice. You want to loosen that hull off the rice. And then we heard winnowing or um, Gene was saying, you know, call it fanning, not winnowing, where you're shaking that basket and having those, those hulls blow off so you have the finished product uh, that's ready to eat. I should mention too that, you know, if, let's say you get 100 pounds of uh, wild rice on a lake, you know, what does that finish down to, to finish product? It depends how ripe it was when you picked it, but probably 30 to 40 pounds, perhaps, a finished rice out of 100 pounds of, uh, of green or unfinished wild rice that you've harvested. Now is a traditional way to harvest. A lot of ricers these days use rice processors to finish their rice. And a lot of these could be mechanized um, systems people have developed to, to finish the wild rice. And a lot of these are kind of mom and pop operations. You got to hunt and peck to see um, who's finishing rice and how much they charge, things like that. But um, that's kind of an ongoing thing too, is a lot of people don't take their rice to, to rice processors or, or other people who know how to finish it because it it's a chore and you have to know how to do it right. So if you want to harvest, uh, here's kind of the, the short story on harvest regulations. Um, just like if you go to deer hunting or fishing, it requires a state um, license. And all this is for state harvesters. Tribal harvesters um, are not required to get a state license if they're exercising their treaty rights. So this is requirements for uh, state harvesters. It's um, about 25 bucks for a season for a, a harvest license, or you can get one day licenses as well. We talked about some equipment requirements. I mean, it's not a lot. You got to be get to what you need, but it's essentially a canoe, a push pole and flails or knockers. Um, there's different ways to, to make these. We've done some workshops here at 1854 Treaty Authority too to, to teach people how to do it, but it's essentially things you need to, to acquire and make yourself some of these things. A season date, I mentioned how rice is usually ripe at the end of August or the beginning of September. And it's really up to the ricers to make that determination. This can cause some hard feelings too. We don't want people in rice beds early uh, doing damage. I know there's always this pressure if there's a good rice crop, you wanna be the first one in there, first one out, but you know, you're just doing damage to the rice crop and you're not even maximizing your, your effort as well. You want that ripe to be rice and ready to fall. So um, yeah, it's kind of like on your honor as far as um, determining when that rice is ripe. Harvest hours under state regs are nine to three every day. Um, currently, we do not post lakes open for harvest. That used to be a practice where tribes would post some, state would post some lakes, or the state and tribal um, staff would work together with harvesters to post lakes. Um, that's kind of gone away now. It's that's a long story we could talk about on the side as well. But um, you know the the tribal tradition and really, and I think mostly on reservations, they still post an opening day on lakes. They'll get a committee together to agree on when the lake is ripe and ready for harvest. Cause you want to, um, again, you, don't, you want to avoid damage and make sure rice is being harvested in a good way. And only typically only tribal members are allowed to harvest wild rice within reservation boundaries. So that's something else to be aware of. But otherwise um, on that cedar territory, you know, states are open, lakes are open for state or tribal harvesters. Only people um, harvest wild rice. This is kind of giving an idea. The graph kind of goes backwards. So 2020 is on the left here, but you can see for the last, oh, 30 years or so here, we've been um, kind of fluctuating between 1,500 and 2,000 wild rice licenses sold each year. You can see how this really has declined from the 60s and 70s when we used to be up around you know, 14 to 16,000 in a good year. Um, part of this, you know, why there's more people racing back in the day is there used to be a lot more money into it. People would make money um, harvesting wild rice. So that's part of it. Part of it too, again, I think is just people kind of losing that tradition and, and uh, you know, not getting outdoors as much as they used to on these things. So we're always trying to push to get um, recruit, retain harvesters, get people out there and uh, harvesting in a good way.
again, this does not capture tribal harvesters, right? Since tribal harvesters do not require a state wild rice license. So we don't really have a, a good handle on how many har tribal harvesters there are. I've done some estimates and I've seen numbers between maybe 10 and 13,000 tribal harvesters, but um, kind of a little bit of an unknown since tribal harvesters aren't required to get a license. Um, we do have a wild rice resource guide here at the 1854 Tree Authority. Again, our goal is to get people out there harvesting wild rice. And so this guide talks a little bit about some of the things I talked about tonight, biology, harvest regs, harvesting, finishing rice, and, and probably really helpful in there is a, a location guide. It basically lists where wild rice waters are found in Northeastern Minnesota in that seeded territory. So it gives you an idea of, of uh, spots to check, check out each year. It's not updated each year to tell you how good it is, but at least gives you an idea of some some waters to check each year and, and you know, gives you a starting point, especially if you've never harvested before and don't know where to go. So this is available on our website as well. Um, check it out. Another thing we do each fall on our website is we provide wild rice condition updates. Um, basically, again, to give harvesters an idea of where to go and how it's looking. So we have you know, a quick blurb on what it's looking like on a lake. We have pictures from the ground and those aerial photos I mentioned, we include those as well. So it's a pretty handy tool for racers to you know, really save a lot of time scouting. And you know, there's both sides of the coin here. I don't wanna give away anyone's uh, honey hole of rice or concentrate pressure, but again, our goal is to really get harvesters out there. I, I think it's important. So yeah, our website's a great resource every fall. Well, a couple last things here, again, close to wrapping up. Uh, wild rice is a natural food that's good for you. It's high in protein and carbohydrates, low in fat, uh, rich in vitamin B and other things. So yeah, it's, it's a healthy food source and, and, and that's why it's a, it's a good natural food to consume. There is a difference between wild rice and paddy rice. Paddy rice is still wild rice, but paddy rice is grown in farm paddies or farm fields. So that's why it's called paddy rice. Um, it's cultivated in artificially created fields and mechanically harvested, can be hybridized and grown fertilizers, herbicides, and insecticides. And the big way to really tell it is a lot of the stuff you'll see in the store is the cheaper stuff by cost and the darker in color um, is usually what the paddy rice is. And so I guess just be aware that there's a difference between the natural hand harvested wild rice and the cultivated or, or paddy wild rice. And the paddy wild rice is supposed to be labeled where it says cultivated wild rice, but it's sometimes hard to see. So you got to just pay attention to, to know um, which one you're buying. And you know, we obviously promote um, buying natural wild rice. Um, a lot of stores have it. I'll put in a plug to Boys Ford here as well. Um, they sell some of their wild rice and make it available as well. So just again, know the difference. Um, yeah, the final thing I really want to touch on is some of our education outreach, which Marnie really heads up. And it's been great the last four or five years. We've worked with some other partners and done some um, Manoman camps and workshops. Um, get people out to try harvesting, to try parching wild rice, to try finishing wild rice. We've had workshops to develop push poles and knockers. So again, trying to teach, educate, promote that wild rice harvest. And so again, I'm checking with us again this fall. I don't know what the whole COVID thing's going to do, but perhaps we'll be able to have a a race camp again somewhere this fall to get an opportunity to, to get out and try it. It's been a real success. It's been some of the, the best programs we've run, I think. So I, I always thank Marnie on this one. Some resources to check out. I mentioned our website, um, other tribal websites, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commissioner, the reservations have a lot of wild rice information. Uh, if you're looking for books, I'd recommend Wild Rice and the Ojibwe People. Um, contains a lot of um, some biology information, but more a lot of the cultural importance of wild rice as well. Um, so that's a, definitely a great resource to check out if you're interested in doing some reading and, and learning more. Finally, what can I do? I think I've touched on a lot of these things already, but again, I think it's important to harvest wild rice. Um, we need people to care about the resource and those are, are gonna be the wild rice harvesters. So um, always try and promote harvest and to do it again in the right way. Uh, be aware, you know, wild rice, I mentioned before, is, is not a weed or something to be pulled in if it's in the way of your boat or your cabin or your dock, I guess. Just be, recognize and appreciate the importance of uh, wild rice. And finally, as I mentioned, know, know the difference between wild rice and paddy rice. I think that's it. I know I went through a lot in a hurry there, but hopefully that gives you a little uh, flavor of 
wild rice biology, conservation, a harvest, things like that. Um, feel free to always contact me for more information or check out our website. Um, I think with that, I can turn it back to Marnie. Darren, that was awesome. Thank you so much. We already have a smattering of questions rolling in right now. And I can uh, say probably the most <laughs> frequently asked questions. A lot of folks wanna know why there are um, posted hours for ricing during the daytime. Um, what's the purpose of that? I know there's a, there's a handful of purposes, but also somebody had mentioned, well, if we wanna increase the number of um, rice harvesters out there, why wouldn't we make it a larger window? Great question. So we were in some work groups here a few years back about talking about harvest regs. You know, if we want to recruit, retain harvesters, should it be later in the day to get kids, people after work, things like that. And so the reason I was told about the harvest hours is one in the morning, if the plants are kind of dewy and wet, that rice might not fall very well. So you want to give a little time to dry in the morning. And then the night I've heard different things in the afternoon, um, give that rice a chance to rest, to ripen a little bit more, to stand back up. Um, I've also heard to give waterfall a chance to, to use that, that area. So those are some of the thoughts of why the nine to three year, um, but again, there's other thoughts that, you know, maybe we should, you know, open a little later in the day to give more people an opportunity. So it's a, a point of debate for sure, I think. Yeah, good question. Um, Another one is, oh yeah, <laughs> Mike Connor, who was actually Gene's racing partners answered too. It doesn't all ripen all at one time. That's one of the things that he actually talked about in our, our one of my little interview with him today. Um, yeah, unfortunately I had to cut that part off, but thank you, Mike, for letting us know that's true. It does ripen different periods. Um, we have a question here from Rachel. One of the most frequently asked questions we get in the fall is, where can I get my rice finished? Uh, she just learned that there's a wild rice processing business being started up around Finland, also seed cleaning. How many processors in the 1854 area and where can we get in contact with them? That's a tricky one. I, you know, I personally think that's one of the biggest hangups for someone to start ricing. I mean, yeah, I can find a canoe and a partner and figure out some uh, push pole and some knockers but now I've harvested this wild rice now what right so there is no formal contact list the DNR for a while on their web page was asking processors who wants to be listed on their web page every year so there'll be a few people but that has kind of gone away so it's largely word, word of mouth unfortunately um with that every fall track me down I kind of have an informal list I'm willing to share um so um get a hold of me and um I can share some names, but again, always my disclaimer is I don't, a lot of people, I don't know who wants their name, name share, if they're still active or if they take minimum and there's all these disclaimers, but uh, I try to keep kind of an informal list. True. I actually found out a couple up in order on Friday I met that they're processing and oh yeah, even one of our panelists had sent them to my, my grandpa. <laughs> um, check out our YouTube channel, says Michelle, our past Sessions are posted there. Um, Mike says you, if you rice and run out of people on the shore, once you, you pack it up after a day of collecting, um, the Mox and Telegraph is a good way to find out. Um, let me see. So thank you to a couple of our panelists for, for answering. How can we be sure the rice we buy benefits, benefits the communities, um, usually from the bands themselves. Many of them within the state do sell their own. Um, Let me see. Is there even wild rice in Grand Portage? Somebody asks. My understanding there is. Um, so our focus is all off reservation, so we don't really do any work on Grand Portage or Boys Fort Reservation. But there is some rice within Grand Portage. I do know that, and I, I think there's enough even for a little bit of harvest in some spots, but um, no, no huge beds that I'm aware of. All right. Hey guys, I just realized that it's 714 and just a couple of people are already hopping out. We want to do the prize drawing and then get back. We have a few more questions. So let's hand it over to Keisha. All right. 
so we will we'll do this quick and get back to the the fun questions this was an amazing program darren i, I loved it darren and gene this was was great but okay to the prizes we have seven prizes and okay, i'm going to share my screen here so you guys can see the lovely uh, wheel of names that we have. I've got everybody's name on here. I'll be sending you guys we'll an email tomorrow telling you the gifts, that, the prizes that are available, let you guys choose which ones you like. Uh, first come, first serve. If you live in or close to Duluth, if you could swing by either 1854 or the uh, Historical Society to pick them up, that's fantastic. If you don't live close by, not a worry. We can we can stick it in the mail for you. We'll get those out. Thanks a lot, everybody. And I will turn it back over to Marnie and Darren to vote for questions. Congratulations, all. Well done. OK, I got two more questions here in the uh, Q&A box. Um, actually, they're, they're both kind of ecology, biology area questions, um, but I do want to get some feedback from Jalen also. So Ben Clark reads, are there any other mutualisms with rodents, for instance, muskrats and wild rice? Yeah, that's in muskrats is an interesting one. I, interesting one. I kind of glossed over that a little bit. Um, you know, some people would consider muskrat as a potential impact to wild rice. You know, they'll rip up some wild rice and make their huts out of it. But I've heard tribal members and elders call muskrats a benefit as the gardeners or cleaners of lake that maybe it actually helps control competing vegetation. Maybe they stir the sediment to promote wild rice growth. So muskrats are kind of thought as a benefit actually, which is, which is interesting. So good question. That's a good question. Um, one more here. Sherry wants to know, has research been done on ergot to, and how to decrease its prevalence in some lakes? Yeah, I don't know much about that. I get a call every couple of years about people. It's a, it's a fungal disease. looks like a little almost ball growing on the wild rice. Um, I get calls, you know, is it a health concern? What causes it? And I, fortunately, there's not a lot of information for that in wild rice. So I, I don't have a good answer. You know, the, the thought is once you clean and process your rice, that that would be removed. But a little bit of an unknown, for sure. That's kind of all the questions I see right now. Um, I'm answering Brooke right now. She wants to know, can you give us more info on what to look for on rice heads that indicate they're ready for harvest? Um, I'm actually going to point that one to Jalen. Jalen, is there some magic to know when rice is ready? Ask the spirits. No. <laughs> all right, talk to the rice. <laughs> So you, it usually turns a little bit more golden. I guess it starts out as a green, as you saw on, on Darren's um, presentation. But as you get more into the season, they'll turn green. And then like the heads will kind of lighten up or they'll sprout out. And then you can also just go out and kind of give a, a light tap. And pretty much it's just, it'll fall off if it's ready to go. Um, and at that point, you can go ahead and go do that. That's true. I know that. Some folks will they'll tap and they'll get rice falling off. They'll beat the stalks and they'll get rice falling off that is still kind of milky in the in the um, sheath, and that needs a lot more time to harden and ripen. Um, Jalen, is there anything else that you want to add that you that you think is really important about protecting rice or something that the general community should know? We didn't cover. Um, well, I've heard like Gene say and a lot of the other elders in that lake, they always kind of talk about the nighttime racing. Um, and there are people that have gone out and done that. And what I've what they've told me is that that time is for like the spirits to race. And so for when you go out during the day, that's how much you're allowing the spirits to race during the night. And so like they, that's their time. So if you're going out there, it's kind of like you're going and bumping into their canoe. Um, and so sometimes it can you might not have like the best day the next day when you're going out, um, but that's one of the like, one of the smaller things, I guess. And even on that, or one thing too, that even on that lake, I've even seen some um, some of like the climate 
change happening, like taking its uh, effects on the on the lake. You know, there's always a lot of things that um, there's always a lot of um, rice on the lake. I feel like for most seasons, and sometimes there's like a big storm that'll knock a lot of them off. But talking to the elders, I hear like the stories of how thick the rice used to actually be. So if I could uh, see if I could share my screen. So that's a, just like a general Google Maps thing of uh, Net Lake. And so most, there's, I don't know, can you guys see my cursor? Yep. So usually there's a lot of rice kind of up in this, uh, by Swamp Island up in this <clears throat> northern part of the lake and kind of goes right in between um, Wood Duck and Popple Creek. Um, the main part that I like to, or that I've heard of is like right by this um, little tiny island, it's called Plum Island. There's a little patch that comes like right here, but I've heard that even like 20 or 15 years ago, there's almost a whole strip of rice that went through this whole area. And now it's just kind of laid down to here. And then there's a little bit behind uh, Big Island down here. And I guess <clears throat> back in the day, that used to be almost too thick to even pull through. So you need to get the big burly guys to go through there. Um, but so even, so even though Net Lake itself doesn't really have too many things to inhibit the rice growth on the lake, they're still, it's still being affected um, with like the climate change just in general. Awesome. Yeah, Mike, Mike Connor's giving some good feedback too on when the rice is ready. He's a long time racer. He's actually Gene's partner. <laughs> Thanks Darren for answering the question. And thank you, Jalen. Um, Anybody have anything else? So I think we'll wrap it up. I didn't want to take too much of everybody's time. I know some folks need to go eat dinner and put kids to bed. Um, like I said, we will uh, we will be sending out um, some more resources tomorrow. Keep your keep looking for that and um, drop us a line and email at eighteen fifty four anytime, and we can certainly get it uh, to the right person. Uh, anything else, Keisha? No, not from my end. I just want to thank everybody. It was a great program. I loved having everybody uh, come. It's great to see so many people attending. True that. Muriel is even posting, my grandma used to say. That's some good knowledge right there. Thanks, Muriel. Jimmy uh, Gwetch to everybody. Kiego Abam and Minoa. Sure.